This is the Economic Club of Florida, a distinguished platform for discussion of the major national issues of the day. On today's program, Miami entrepreneur Saif Ishuf of the business development firm Lab22C with a glimpse of what Florida could become in the future. We moved over 1.5 trillion of assets under management capital to Miami and Florida in the last 48 months. There's a global ranking, it's called the GFCI. It's a very nerdy index, which stands for Global Financial Center Index. It's a ranking of global financial centers. Miami had never been on the list ever before. This year we landed on the list for our first time at number 24. Dubai is 21. Good day and welcome to the 579th in our series of Distinguished Speaker Programs. I'm Harvey Bennett for the Economic Club of Florida. Florida has the fourth largest economy in the United States. If it were its own country, it would be the 16th largest economy in the world. As of fall 2023, the gross domestic product was $1.6 trillion annually. And it keeps growing, now at a rate of 6.1% annually, leading all other states in economic growth. And nowhere has that growth been more evident than in Miami and the greater Miami-Dade County area. We're very pleased to have with us today someone who knows intimately about that growth and the factors and players who've contributed to it, plus the implications for the rest of Florida. He is Saif Ishuf, founder and managing partner of Lab 22C. Saif, welcome. Thanks so much, Harvey. I'm really excited to be here with you chatting about everything that's happening in our state and the future of our region. Lab 22C, your company, a very intriguing name. Do tell. Tell us more. Um, I'm so glad that you asked. Um, I, the name is really a combination of two very specific things. One, uh, I love the concept when you're building companies and helping to support institutions of testing experiments, hypotheses. And so uh, the lab part of the name is exactly that. My company gets to serve as advisors to the best founders, investors, and operators in the world and institutions that are looking at building here in our great state of Florida. And the 22C actually represents, I view our work as focused on individuals, institutions, and companies that are solving our world's most vexing challenges for the second half of the 21st century into the 22nd century. So when you put that together, you get Lab 22C. And that's really the origin of the name and something that uh, gives me great joy in what we're seeking to build, the companies and institutions we're supporting here in our great state of Florida. And I suppose you are a great connector of sorts between all of that energy and innovation, especially all of the people that have moved into South Florida in, over the last really 20 years plus, but really since the pandemic, as well as companies that have decided to relocate as well, I imagine. I uh, acquired a nickname uh, many, many moons ago, uh, referred to as Miami's Connector in Chief. Uh, I would only make one edit to that, which is I'm seeking to be Florida's Connector in Chief. And a lot of that, the origin of it, Harvey, is not as a function of just cheesily meeting people and exchanging cards, but uh, I believe that relationships should be transformational, not transactional. Uh, I've had a lot of different chapters from my career uh, going back to when I graduated from law school at the University of Miami almost 25 years ago. I've been a founder, investor, operator, uh, worked in not-for-profit, higher ed, spent a little bit of time uh, adjacent to local government. And so in that role, I've been able to interact with a lot of different people in the public square, uh, both public sector leaders, private sector. And so my joy is connecting people. And I have a life motto, which is that I want everybody I know to meet everybody that I know. And out of that, build shared value, not just simply high five each other, but try to figure out how can we tackle big problems together and how can we create shared value? And I think that's really what's propelling a region like Miami and by extension, our state forward. Like approximately two thirds of Florida's residents, you were not born here in Florida, but you and your family came for the opportunity that so many others seek as well. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and your life journey so far. Um, my family moved here in the mid-70s from Guyana in South America. 
And we were very much fleeing the conditions of a country that was a democratic country that got seized with a, a socialist regime. And my family, my dad was a British educated military officer and entrepreneur. My mom was an American educated uh, school teacher and uh, real estate entrepreneur. And they realized that the country that we came from and that me and my sisters were born in Guyana was heading in the opposite direction economically of being able to provide promise, uh, free enterprise. So we moved to America in the mid 70s. And so um, while I came over to America when I was very young, we moved to Miami. I was only two years old. I like to say I was born in the Caribbean, made in the 305 or made in Florida. I feel that we live in the greatest state, in the greatest city, in the greatest country in the world. And I love the fact that uh, being born somewhere else, I proudly declare myself as an American by choice, which is the reason why in both my personal, professional, civic and business endeavors, I say I am the loudest, proudest member of Team America in everything that I do. Terrific. Saif Ishuf, founder and managing partner of Lab22C, thank you. We're certainly looking forward to hearing your upcoming presentation on the opportunity capital in Florida's rocket ship economy. Harvey, thank you so much. I'm excited. As I like to say, let's go. <laughs> well, let's do it. Now, here's club board chair Marion Hoffman, vice president of business solutions at Indelible Business Solutions with our formal introduction. You all are in for a real treat this afternoon. Miami native Saif Ishuf is a recognized leader in navigating disruptive forces and he's played a pivotal role in prope propelling Miami to become the 21st century's fastest growing innovation capital hub in the United States. Renowned as a presidential leadership scholar, German Marshall Fund scholar, and Aspen Institute fellow for civil society, he was honored as South Florida's most innovative CEO by the Levon Center for Innovation. As Lab 22 cs visionary founder, SIFE provides advisory services to entities ranging from founders to family offices, specializing in strategic partnerships, human capital development, and philanthropy. Noteworthy achievements include facilitating groundbreaking collaboration between Global Coding Boot Camp, Iron Hack, and the Miami Marlins. Saif's impactful roles include serving as Vice President of Engagement for Florida International University, where he secured $70 million for institutional impact. As a founding Senior Advisor for Innovation and Technology to Miami Mayor Francis Suarez, he co-founded the Venture Miami team, attracting companies and funds to relocate to the Magic City. Saif is founding executive director for City Year, which helps students and schools succeed by giving young people valuable skills to prepare them to become the next generation of leaders. Saif is a Georgetown University Foreign Service graduate, and he earned his Juris Doctorate from the University of Miami School of Law. He continues to be a sought-after advisor, board member, speaker, and writer on innovation, talent, and competitiveness. Saif really is a South Florida powerhouse and an inspirational leader. We're honored to have him here today as our Economic Club speaker, Please join me in welcoming me, my friend, Saif Asif. Good afternoon. How's everyone feeling? Well, uh, before I begin my remarks, I have to start with a note of personal gratitude to Marion and the entire leadership of the Economic Club of Florida. It means so much to me as a native of Miami and a native of Florida to have an opportunity to speak among such a prestigious room as we have assembled here. And um, I think everybody knows this. Marion is somebody that none of us have an ability to say no to. <laughs> and so when she calls you, the only correct answer is yes, I will be there. And um, I also want to say before I begin my remarks, uh, I want to extend a personal note of sympathy to all of you in the in this area 
following the recent uh, inclement weather that you experienced as a native of South Florida, we know exactly what it feels like when these weather systems come through and how it can throw in disarray our daily lives, not only with losing power, but in lots of other ways that impact, especially the hardworking people in our region. So I want to let, let it be known that it was not missed uh, to myself and also to my business partner, Andy, uh, on our way up here, we were tracking that. So um, when Marion reached out to me to, to speak in front of the Economic Club of Florida, I had so many things that I wanted to share. And um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a warning before I really dig into my remarks that my, my heritage is blended in a lot of different ways. So I'm both from the Caribbean, was born in Guyana. I am of ethnic Indian origin, and I grew up in Miami amongst Cuban people. So that basically means that you're going to get the intensity of a Bollywood film <laughs> with uh, a little bit of the drama of a telenovela. So um, if uh, if I disappoint, I promise you it's it's uh, it's a function of where I'm from. And today, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, a confluence of different things. And uh, I want to frame it as where we were, where we are and where we're going and challenging a lot of our collective assumptions about what's happening in our state. And Miami, in many regards, is a proxy for what's happen happened and what is happening and where we're going as a state. Um, I, I want to start with sharing an image. I actually don't have a lot of slides because I would much rather have a human conversation with all of you. And before I show the slide, I also will tell you that part of my narrative of what I'm going to be imparting today, some people have jokingly said to me, Saif, your life, you're kind of like the brown forest gump. Um, so there's a lot of experiences that I've had over my journey that are like that. But I want to share an image that I think is a centering image uh, for all of us today. So this is a picture that I actually took just a couple of months ago, and it was significant for me. It's an image. Uh, my mom and I were flying back into Miami International Airport after having spent a couple of days in the country that I was born in. Guyana, which is in the Caribbean. So it was, a, it was a fascinating moment for me, almost 50 years after my family moved to America, being on a plane, an American Airlines flight, flying back into my hometown with my mom, who actually came to America to go to college in 1958. But now, 50 years later, seeing the vista of this place that I call home. And I start there because I think that it allows us to have a sense of transformation that's happening not only in places like South Florida, but really all around our state. And uh, as I mentioned, I was born in the Caribbean, but as I like to say, I was born in the Caribbean, but I was made in the 305. And um, But the reality is I didn't move to Miami. I said it last night. I actually moved to a place, Barney Bishop knows, Bruce knows, I didn't move to Miami. I moved to a place called Miami. And it's true. And my story is very much emblematic of the story of millions of people in South Florida, if you pay attention to what's happened. And so while I moved to Miami, I've had the opportunity to see the city transform from Miami to Miami to Miami and to whatever New Yorkers might call it today, which is a great onshore, offshore tax haven, I think. But I want to start with this image, and I want to start a couple of blocks north of when we think of downtown uh, to one of my earliest memories in moving to America. Um, it was Friday. I was at prayer services with my, father, with my late father, and we were in what is the oldest mosque in Florida, in uh, one of the historical black neighborhoods in Miami, Liberty City. And I was an immigrant kid, did not know much about uh, football or sports, I was about three or four years old. And after the prayer services were over, all of the kids in the service ran outside and they surrounded a guy that as a four-year-old to me looked like black Superman. And what I didn't know at the time is it was Muhammad Ali. And Muhammad Ali then took the time to meet with every single kid and would put you on, on his shoulders and tell you that you too were a champ. 
And that concept and that image stuck with me in the ensuing 45 years of my life in thinking about how it is that we know the often quoted quote, we stand on the shoulders of giants. The my journey and what I want to talk about, really Miami is a function of being a city that has been set up for success in a lot of different ways. And so that's really my, my, port, my point of beginning. And if you uh, are a student of history, as I am, it's important to realize that there's a condensed window of time, essentially 1980 to 2020, that is punctuated by so many different events that are emblematic of this city that has become a hyperscaler akin to a Singapore, akin to a Dubai, but more importantly, right here in our Florida. But there's been lots of challenges along the way. We think of Miami 1980 as documented in a phenomenal book, if you haven't read it, called Year of Dangerous Days, written by a guy named Nicholas Griffin. Three massive things happened at once. You had the McDuffie race riots. You had the arrival of the Mariel refugees from Cuba. And you had the advent of the cocaine cowboys. That was 1980. That was just 44 years ago. For those of you who remember, Bruce and I were talking about it. The city was literally burning down. And in that journey, that is something that I've been very, very fortunate to be able to witness in my own career trajectory and in my own journey. So I don't want to bore you too much with my own biography, but I think my story, again, is akin to what has happened to lots of people in South Florida. Um, I, my biography, as far as where I went to school, has already been stated, but when I came back from college and before I went to law school, I started to think about building a technology company. And when I graduated from law school, I focused a lot more attention on building my first software company. I was 24 years old. I recognized that I wanted to be near a university, so I tried to be uh, co-located on the campus of University of Miami. No one believed that universities should have startups on it, so I had to find an office in South Miami near the University of Miami, and in order that I could get something that some of us might remember who've worked in fiber, so I could get a T1 line, so that way I could have high-speed internet in the year 1999. But I want to tell you what drives what I get to do today, the best, worst piece of advice I ever got as a young founder. So here I am, I'm full of energy, lots more hair than I have right now. And I went to a tech conference in Boston. And there was a guy who was a guru of American technology. His name is Guy Kawasaki. And I'm outing him and I know this is being live streamed. So I'd love to chat with Guy about this. So Guy Kawasaki was the chief marketing officer for Steve Jobs, and he helped to create the marketing campaign for the Mac computer. So I was so excited as I was building my startup. Here I am, I'm in Miami, I'm in Florida, and I finally get my moment during a coffee break to chat with Guy Kawasaki. And I said, hey, Guy, I'm building a vendor management software company, and uh, what advice do you have for me? And he said, move from Florida. That was 24 years ago. And I listened and I continued to build my company and I disregarded what was the best, worst piece of advice I ever had. Because I believed that that Miami, Miami, Miami had something that was going to position us to win the second half of the 21st century. That very special element is human capital. And so in my career, I've had an opportunity. In the 2008 financial meltdown, I recognized after having spent a career helping to run my dad's engineering services business, I realized that I wanted to go back. I wanted to go right back to the neighborhoods that my, my family had been welcomed to. And I led an educational national nonprofit called City Year. My dear friend and business partner, Andy, was one of the early board members. We would sit in downtown Miami in 2008 there was nothing going on. It was like an economic nuclear bomb had hit Florida, had hit South Florida. And we said, we're going to go back into the most challenging schools and we're going to recruit young people to serve as tutors, mentors, and role models. And we're going to focus long game on human capital. Schools that people might have forgotten about. Schools like Bruce Hoffman's alma mater, uh, Miami Jackson. Schools like Barney Bishop's alma mater, Carroll City the Chiefs, very, very different schools, 
lot of the alumni doesn't look like Bruce and, and Barney right now. I'm just saying, you know, but, you know, that's the changing nature of our cities. But we focused on that. We focused on human capital. I also then had an opportunity to play a leadership role at FIU. And we, again, double clicked on this idea of what is the role that our public research universities can play in being catalytic elements in driving economic development. Our state university system sees that everywhere. We know that driving economic development and driving innovation is not about tech bros at coffee shops. It's about PhDs and postdocs sitting at labs that are actually creating bench science that can actually go to the market. That's what happens at great institutions like the University of Florida and the University of Central Florida and FIU and the entire SUS. So I had that opportunity to play that role. So in that 20 plus year journey that I was in, I always thought it's about the people. We have to develop human capital in our K-12 system. We have to make sure that we're supporting early learning. We have to be focusing on how it is we're creating an actual pathway. So from when a young person graduates from college, they can see their way to a meaningful career. And so I think a lot about this and a lot of the reason why I, you know, people see me and they see the rocket ship that I, uh, I wear. And I think about uh, a couple of things because I love uh, space movies. And so um, how many of you in here have seen the movie Interstellar? So it's not a science fiction film, if you haven't seen it. It's actually a love story, but it's the love story and the story of love between a father and his daughter. And I think about that with the rocket ship that I get to wear and the main character in there, uh, played by Matthew McConaughey, and uh, uh, you know he makes a commitment before he jumps through interstellar space that he will return to his daughter. And I think every single one of us, when we wake up in the morning, we commit ourselves to our work because we will cross space and time to return to our loved ones. And I think about that in terms of the work that we get to do, because some of us, our families, maybe their position for success, but the work has to be about something so much bigger. If you're trying to move the chicken and the egg, you have to ask yourself, are you setting up everybody's child for this form of success? Are you enabling and creating those types of ecosystems in those environments? And so that's the reason why when I wear the rocket ship pin, I think about that movie. I think about uh, that notion in that film, Interstellar, which again, is really what our work is about. And specifically, and this is where I'll get a little bit more personal. Next week, my daughter graduates from high school and she heads off to college in the Northeast. And so when I think about the work of what we're all trying to do, Miami and Florida, these parts of the world win, not because we figured out a way to recruit another massive global hedge fund or a venture capital firm, but the talent, our kids, your kids, your grandkids, other people's kids, will we be a place they want to come back to? That's how we win the future. Will we have the types of jobs and opportunities that really represent everything that we believe has been driving our state forward? Because I go around the country and I go around the world, I'm going to the Middle East next week, and I said, listen, when you think of Florida, we're a G20 economy. That's who we are. We're on par with Australia. That's who we are. We're winning in the most cutting edges of the economy every which way you turn, from the Space Coast to our port infrastructure, to our university systems. In every way, we are better poised to win. I created my company, Lab22C, because I like to work like a, a scientist, laboratory, but I also want to work supporting people, institutions, founders, and builders that are trying to solve problems for the second half of the 21st century into the 22nd century. Because I believe it's places like Florida that will win. That's the reason why I spend time in other global hubs like Singapore, like Dubai, because I believe that we have more in common with what's going on there. And I think that we also bring our history, our heritage, and so much of what has made Florida a place of safe harbor for so many people that are choosing, they're voting every single day with their feet and coming to Florida. 
And that's a good thing. But coupled with that also has to be, how are we making sure our Florida is a place that the people who live here, the everyday folks are part of that opportunity economy? The good people who are helping us here today who prepared our meal, is their Florida a place where them and their families are able to live and thrive? Or is it a place where we've priced ourselves in only for people who are able to buy into the dream? And what's made us so great is that we've always been a place where families like mine have been welcomed. And so in my journey, uh, I've had an opportunity to play a lot of different roles. And one of the ones that I'm very proud of was in the middle of the pandemic, I got a call uh, on December 5th, 2020 from the mayor of Miami. He had a very famous tweet that went around the world where a venture capitalist said, hey, guys, what if we move Silicon Valley to Miami? And the mayor responded with, how can I help? Which is something that a lot of politicians don't actually throw that sense of service out there. And the next day, the mayor, uh, who I've known a very long time, said, Saif, I need to borrow you. And I give a lot of credit to the president of FIU for saying, um, we need to figure this out as a public research university. If a mayor calls, uh, public sectors have to stand with each other in order to create economic benefit and shared gain. And so I went and I served as a senior advisor while still running my team at the university, while not costing the taxpayers of Florida a dollar more. So as my wife says, it was two jobs, one paycheck. That's part of public service. That's what you're supposed to do when you do it the right way. And I co-founded with him an entity called Venture Miami, which has now become a catalytic piece of, if you fast forward to the, uh, a couple of, a, a couple of um, minutes in the video there, um, we are now, just by, by back of the envelope calculations, these are the superlatives. We moved over 1.5 trillion of assets under management capital to Miami and Florida in the last 48 months. There's a global ranking, which somebody like Professor Ridley would know. It's called the GFCI. It's a very nerdy index, which stands for Global Financial Center Index. It's a ranking of global financial centers, right? OECD and World Bank put it out. Miami had never been on the list ever before. This year, we landed on the list for our first time at number 24. Dubai is 21. Imagine never being on a global ranking of the largest global financial centers in the world. And the first time you show up, you get a 20, you land at number 24. We're number one in America for post-pandemic venture capital dollars raised. That means that the majority, the greatest increase in venture capital dollars raised anywhere in America happened here in our state of Florida. And the superlatives continue. Number one in tech, uh, um, technology job growth in America as per LinkedIn. Number one most economically resilient city in the world as per The Economist magazine. And, 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 and. But what's very important is all of this. In Miami, sometimes I use, uh, and I don't use a lot of profanity, but in, in Miami, sometimes there's a word that comes across like an F word. And that F word for a lot of people in Miami is Florida. And I have to tell the folks that, and I was joking with Barney, I said, listen, we just had the Formula One race. And a lot of people are new to Miami. They think that when you get to the edge of Hard Rock Stadium, once you drive north of the Formula One race, you fall off the edge of the earth. And what they're un unable to see, which is part of the bridging role that I now get to play, is that there is a much, there's a G20 country here that's a world leader in space that has research universities that are creating IP that are going to guarantee our competitiveness as America in a world where we have geopolitical adversaries that want to do us harm every single day. We're also a state that people forget about it that has military assets that are unparalleled. Three combatant commands plus Space Florida. There's no other military state in the union that has that. CENTCOM, SOCOM, Special Operations Command, uh, SOUTHCOM, and of course, uh, our assets at Kennedy Space Center. Nowhere else has that. And we haven't even begun to tap into what that means. An aerospace industry, a trade and logistics industry, high-speed rail not paid for by the taxpayer, and, 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 and. There's so much more that we have that is part of Florida. Parts of our state where families can actually buy a single family home and begin their journey towards the American dream or the Florida dream. It's the reason why folks like myself and my business partner, we tell people, check out Jacksonville, check out these other parts of the state. There's great things, great people, opportunity happening all around the state of Florida. It is not just concentrated between Wynwood and Brickell. 
There's a lot happening there and we want a lot of that, but there's a role and a competitive advantage to every single thing that's happening. So I'll tell you a little bit more about me and the work I do. So I founded this company called Lab22C, getting to work every single day with really some of the most mind blowing founders that are creating technologies that are the stuff of Star Wars. Um, companies that are doing things like taking the sun's light and shooting it through a magnifying lens. And when it comes out on the other side of it, it's a laser that can then generate power at a cost per kilowatt hour that is exactly in line with what great energy companies like FPL and NextEra are building. We get to advise a company that's literally building flying boats, electric sea gliders. They've created an entire new category of flying vessel rated not by the FAA, but by the Coast Guard. These companies are coming. They're paying attention to our Florida. They're looking at creating partnerships with our colleges, with our universities, and absorbing our talent. And in my role, going back to the Star Wars analogy, is, you know, I had a mentor who said, you know, every single one of us is a character from Star Wars, right? And I thought about this and I said, man, I hope I'm not Chewbacca. <laughs> um, and uh, and because that would be that would be not a good thing. And my poor wife, if that's the case. And then I realized that, um, you know, I get to work uh, in doing something that there's a character in Star Wars we all know who is responsible for cyborg human relations, C-3PO. So some of the folks I get to work with are like cyborgs. And I get to translate to the real Miami, the real Florida, humans, what they're doing and how we can build shared economic value. And that C-3PO role is really important because it means we have to pay attention to what's happening in our state capital. We have to pay attention to what's going on in our other economic hubs within our state. And against that backdrop, we have created a landscape that means that our region in the state is an opportunity capital. And for all of us who have children and grandchildren, it means that the Blackstones of this world, the largest institutional asset manager in the world, now has a, a massive strategic presence in Miami. Amazon is setting up 50,000 square feet of footprint in Miami. And, and, and Citadel, one of the largest hedge funds in the world, headquartered in Miami. That's all part of the increase of assets under management in our region. But we have to look at that assets as opportunity for human capital. And again, it has to go back to this idea. How are we developing and retaining, bringing those young people who are part of our state that are going to great institutions here? We all know there was a generation of many of them. And some of you in this room, your kids and grandkids might represent this. They graduate from a great school like a UF or FSU, and then they land in a job in the Northeast. And once they start to, to get moving, it's hard to bring them back to our, our state. We, we want to make sure what's happening in our region, we are creating a electromagnet to ensure that that talent is the driver and is what's forcing forward our competitive advantage. And so that's a little bit about where we were and where we're going. But I want to get even a layer more deeply personal with all of you. Um, because sometimes I think for all of us, we have to ask ourselves, how do we get here what is our underlying reason why we do what we do? And there's a lot of the economic stats that I've shared about, you know, inflow of capital and venture capital dollars raised, but each one of us has a reason why we do what we do. And I think that that is, I was talking to Professor Ridley and he's wearing a tie. And by the way, I think I won the, the bonus quiz. I knew it was Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations on his tie, which shows what a super nerd I am. And I didn't Google it or ask ChatGPT to, to help me answer it. But each one of us has a reason why we do what we do. And I think that that's part of the compelling reason of what makes Florida a place where people want to move to and become a part of. And for me, I'll tell a personal story because I was chatting with Bruce and Marion last night. My late father was actually a political supporter of Bruce back in the day when he was in the state legislature. And uh, um, in 2013, I... Um, it was summer of 2013, and this is a big reason of why I do what I do. Uh, it was July, I won't forget it. And my late father was in the hospital dying of kidney failure. 
And um, it was a really, really difficult month for my, my siblings, for my mom, for myself. And in the midst of that madness of my, my father dying, uh, I got an envelope um, that uh, my daughter, who at that time, she must have been about seven years old, she brought me the envelope and it had this fancy seal on it. And, you know, I opened it up. And um, when she opened it up, it was an invitation uh, to have dinner at the White House with the president to celebrate the end of the month of Ramadan. And I struggled a lot with it because uh, my dad was dying and it was unclear how long it would be before he passed. And so I, um, you know, I went and I sat with him and I shared with him. Now, my dad was somebody who believed, right? He was, an, uh, he said, I'm an American by choice. He had a really funny relationship with politicians. The first question he would ask every politician was, have you ever managed a payroll? Because he believed that a precondition to run for elected office in America should be, have you ever had a white knuckle moment being responsible for making payroll? He said, I don't want to hear about all the other stuff you've done. Do you know what it's like to ensure the people who you work for, there's food on their plate for their family? So I went to my pop and I said he was an engineer. I went to military school in England, was in the British Special Air Service, one of the toughest guys you'll ever meet. So when I became trained as a diplomat, you can imagine, you know, he definitely saw me as much more C-3PO than Han Solo. Um, and, uh, and so I went to him and I said, Dad, I got an invitation to have dinner at the White House. And um, he just looked at me and he said, that's amazing. And so I made my plan. Um, I was going to fly up to D.C., and uh, just spend the night and have that dinner and then fly back the next morning. And so, you know, I flew up to DC and it was a magical night. I mean, it really was a real special night. And, um, uh, you know, I'll say this, this is my one political joke. I'll say, you know, it, yes, it was uh, when 44 was in the white house. My, my business partner is more of a 45 type of guy, but we do agree that we're not so sold on 46. So I'll say that. Um, but uh so I went up and I had a magical night that really lives on in my memory forever uh, for what happened. And of course, lives on in Facebook for forever. And when I came back home to Miami the next morning, my wife was there at the hospital, my mom, my sister, my kids. And when I walked back into the hospital room, I found out that my dad had actually slipped into a coma and would pass away a couple of days later. And um, I think about that a lot especially when I think about what's happening in Miami and what's happening in our state, because my late dad would say something. This is an image from that night. That's a quote from my dad. And he said, we honor the American dream by helping others achieve it. And I think that in everything that we're doing in creating economic value, there has to be a why. It, ha it can't just simply be because this is about what's good for me and for my own sense of economic benefit. It has to be about what is it and so having that moment, the realization I had when I came back was my last conversation on planet Earth with my father was to tell him his son was having dinner at the White House with the president. And what I realized in that moment was he had helped me achieve his version of the American dream. And I think that's the Florida that's the Miami. That's what's driving us forward. Every other part of Beijing does not have that. We have that. New Delhi does not have that. We have that. That is part of what is the secret sauce of the upward trajectory, the aspirational energy that's powering this place in every part of our state. And so I want to jump to what does this all mean? because I've talked about the origin of Miami, I've talked about my own personal story, where do we go from here? Because oftentimes I give a, a different talk, which is about leadership in the age of disruption. And we talk about how um, there's more money being spent on computational power on planet earth in the next five years than will be spent on primary education on earth. So think about that. More money being spent on computational power than we will spend on educating young people everywhere on the planet. So when I think about this, I actually go to this image in my head where um, I had shoulder surgery recently. And the day after the shoulder surgery, my wife and kids had decided to order a new table tennis. Uh, and so I'm sitting there 
with my arm in a strap watching my kids play table tennis, right? Now, the meds were feeling pretty good. I'm not going to lie. But um, you realize that in table tennis, the best part of ping pong or any of these types of racket sports games as a spectator is when you start to get this dynamic flow, this back and forth. And when you're watching it, you see and you hear the ball clicking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And as somebody who gets to advise some of the best founders, best investors in the world, you know, it got me thinking a lot about this age of machines that we're in. And what does this mean? And I think about something very special, which is I believe there is something more powerful than AI, which is what I call HI, human ingenuity in the age of AI, human capital in the age of AI. So I came up with this crazy image, and of course, I gave it to a uh, one of the LLMs to create an image, and the young lady is inspired by my daughter, who's about to head to college. And I thought about this, where do we go from here, whether it's in our economic development agenda for Florida, whether it's in our own personal mission, and thinking about our competitiveness in the age of AI. And what I realized was, like the table tennis game, we have to learn to volley with machines in the age of AI. And learning to volley and channeling that human ingenuity means that we have to embrace a couple of things. One, a sense of play and wonder. How many of us are actually spending time engaging and playing, learning, discovering with these tools? At the end of the day, we're the humans and the machines are there to support and serve our curiosity. We also have to be a lot more curious. There is nothing more deafening or uninspiring than an incurious mind. We all know what it's like. You go to a dinner party and you know the brother-in-law, hey man, what are you reading? Nothing. What are you listening to? Nothing. Well, what do you fill your head with then, right? How in the world are you staying ahead in a world that is moving forward so quickly? The other thing, and I was talking about this, create learning circles. In the age of AI, are we creating circles with each other where we can challenge each other to level up and acquire skills that we don't have? You know, there, there's a great futurist who said, you know, um, the future is going to be defined by our ability to learn, unlearn, and relearn. How many of us are actually doing that? That's what it means to volley in the age of AI, right? And the people who are going to create all kinds of new technologies and opportunities, the people that I get to advise and work with in my C3PO role, those people are thinking like that. In our state, it's up to us as the citizenry to embrace that role. We're not. We're never going to happen, and it's no disrespect to people who elected leadership roles. It's never going to happen because a governmental leader decided to do that. It's going to happen because small groups of us said, we're going to channel that, we're going to learn. And we're also going to engage in this act of upskilling, learning, unlearning, relearning. That's what's going to ensure places like our Florida can keep our competitive advantage because today we're a G20. We could slide backwards. There's no guarantee that tomorrow is there and that somehow we are going to win uh, in a massive way for the second half of the 21st century. It is a globally competitive and fierce economy that what made us great yesterday doesn't set us up for success tomorrow. And so in a lot of the work that I get to do on a daily basis and pushing forward that Miami that I believe in is about challenging everyone around us, including myself, to say, what are we doing to create that differentiated value proposition? How are we doing something that creates value that is so markedly different from everybody around you? That's what it's going to take for us to be able to create that type of Florida and that opportunity capital. Because all of those statistics that I mentioned, number one for venture capital dollars raised post-pandemic, number 24 in the GFCI, those can go like that. And the decision points around whether or not we keep that momentum, it actually belongs to each one of us. Because in many regards, the, the fact is, what's powering our state, yes, we're seeing inbound capital of unbeknownst proportion. What's powering our state is the single mom who says to herself, I'm going to open up a small business. It's two small business owners that say, hey, you know, I sell hot dogs. You make buns. Let's, let's, let's create something together. That's where the value creation is actually happening. And it's also the place where 
elected officials are actually leaning in with the service mindset and saying, how can we help you? How can we make sure more of that is happening? Universities and colleges are saying, how can we support the talent needs that you have? Cities are saying, how can we create more third spaces where we can drive more of that? And at the end of the day, uh, there, you know, there's a, a statement that the greatest social program in America, and I believe this is the case in Florida, is a good job with a fair wage in a safe environment. That's it. It's really, really simple. But I think that that Florida that we love, that Miami that I grew up in, that's a place where, and that I want to see, you know, I want to loop it right back to the rocket ship. I want to ensure, just like in the movie Interstellar, when Matthew McConaughey crossed space and time to reunite with his daughter, that next week, when I send my daughter off to college, just like many of you are in graduation season, sending off, sending off your sons and daughters and grandkids and grand, grand, uh, grandchildren and nieces and nephews off to college, that we all want to reunite with them. And that has to be our driving why. We have to always have a sense within us that we are willing to cross space and time to get there. And so that's what drives me. That's what I believe the opportunity capital, the rocket ship economy is all about in our state. It comes back to it's always been and always going to be about people. So um, I want to stay in touch with everybody because sometimes when I give these remarks, everybody says, hey, hey, man, let's stay in touch. So I like to stay in touch. So I have a cheesy image that looks a little bit like the start of a video game. The one on the left is actually a connection to my LinkedIn. And I actually created my company a newsletter because people will say, like, how do I get more scythe? How do I get more of these insights about what's actually happening in our Florida rocket ship economy? Um, it's an absolute joy to have had this great honor of speaking here at the Economic Club of Florida, sharing insights about what we're doing. Please let's stay in touch. If you if you connect with me on LinkedIn, send me a message. Use the rocket ship emoji so I know it was you. And I promise you we'll stay in touch. I want to learn from you. I also want to share with you my insights and what we're seeing. Because at the end of the day, we're all in this together. There's The only way we can get to where we want to get to is if we see that that collective moon or the stars that we're trying to get to, that every single one of us, it comes back to that statement that my dad said. We honor that American dream by helping others achieve it. It's an absolute honor to have been here with you today. Thank you so much. I think we're going to have some questions now. Are there any questions? Saif, you mentioned high-speed rail. Can you talk to me, tell us more about public transportation and how we compare in Florida to some of these other global hubs that you're visiting um, and, and what can we do to do better? This is, I mean, it's a great question, Ginny. And the truth is this is an area, an, an, a natural area for massive improvement. Um, our, you know, we were, I won't I won't get specific here, but as as Andy and I were traveling here, you know, we're commenting, and actually this was not a comment on Tallahassee, just our infrastructure is lagging. You know, Dubai built a uh, a new metro rail system, and they didn't know what the estimates would be on daily ridership. They now have a ridership on a daily basis of like two and a half million people, and you can get any and everywhere. And you can say, oh, well, they're sitting on oil and gas money. And yes, th there is a, a case to be made, but it's also about smarter, more thoughtful uh, public policy making. And I think that you know, for the next chapter of where we're going, if we want to keep that competitive advantage, it's an area that we absolutely have to look at. It's an area that we also have to think about new economic models where there's a, a there's a better sharing of risk reward against public and private sector. This isn't about taxing fixed income retirees like my mom more, nor is it necessarily about like putting a bunch more money into the pockets of a big private equity fund. It's about how are we creating some sort of shared gain, shared risk and benefit, because that's going to be really, really important. Young people um, and getting them around and the talent that we need, they will vote with their feet. Um, just like affordability is another equally challenging issue topic that we have to think about in our state and all, all around. Chris? Uh, thank you for an excellent talk. I think a lot of that really resonated. I um, was struck by your comment on being the C-3PO that translates kind of from us normal folks, the people that really understand some of the technology. 
Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on some of the things that we may be hearing from some of those folks that almost seem philosophical, like an AGI or a singularity or some of these unique business models that are based on uh, different concepts. And, and what should us normal people think about that? I think it's a great question, Chris. And the reality is it comes back to that sense of curiosity that we all have. We cannot take as a foregone conclusion, first and foremost, and this is a little bit of a controversial statement to make, but um, every single one of us should have a perspective about what do we think the intersection of policy and AI should be like? Because we're talking about our data we're talking about our privacy. Folks like Scott McPherson, they know what I'm talking about. He led Florida through the Y2K challenge, which was unbelievable. But also, I mean, where we're going now is even more complex. I mean, they're, they're unresolved questions. I'll give you one that'll scare the crap out of all of us. So a uh, police body camera footage, okay? Can you data mine using machine learning police body camera footage so that not just body camera of somebody who's getting, you know, arrested or, you know, uh, domestic violence, but then all of a sudden they see that Chris, uh, you know, he double parked. Can, can governments use that data in that way? It's unresolved. There's actually, you can, you can't, maybe, sort of, kind of. So I think it's much more around where are we at in engaging with that? Because I'll tell you, right, um, the move fast and break things mindset that Mark Zuckerberg channeled in creating Facebook, which made it one of the most fat, fastest growing technology companies in the history of ever into meta, that mindset is still there around just like, well, we'll just release these technologies to the wild without any sort of forethought around it, right? And any sort of reflection. And I think as a citizenry, we have a responsibility to be asking, well, is this a good thing? Is this actually something that has net societal positive benefit? Or are we just going to leave it as an unexplored domain? And I think really as a state, we have an opportunity. It's not about more regulation. It's much. It's actually much more around consensus building, much more around how are we creating those spaces for conversation. Universities like UF play a massive role around that. So uh, I will tell you that left to their own druthers, people who are both deploying this capital and building this technology, I have a mentor who is the most successful founder of any technology companies in the state of Florida. He created Magic Leap and he created Mako Surgical. His name is Roni Abovitz. And Roni Abovitz said that we are at an at a existential moment in our world between what he calls computational autocracies and computational democracies. And computational autocracies are not just Beijing. Computational autocracies can also be built within massive, massive companies that are able to create systemic advantage, right? And so I think that we have to avail ourselves as citizenry and as individuals and even as business leaders, how are we thinking about these technologies and these tools and how are we incorporating them into our own professional and personal practice? Because you know, there is a delta around it. How does impact adult learners? Like nobody really talks about that. Like how will these technologies, like Andy and I were coming in on the airport yesterday and we saw an automatic wheelchair and Andy's first comment to me was like, well, there's a job that's gone. Just a, yeah, it was a, it was like, imagine a remote control wheelchair that would take somebody who's unable to walk to their gate. You don't need somebody. It's a little wheelchair that's moving. An algorithm is taking you from check-in to the gate. This is going to, this is not, these things happen faster than any of us can imagine. That's the nature of how disruptive technologies work. This is uh, the last question. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for your enthusiasm and your advocacy. Uh, we really get the feeling that you care and we understand that intrinsically. Appreciate your emphasis on human capital. Um, I just wonder if our educational system is not solely endemic to Florida. It's around the country. It's around a lot of the world, not in the entire world, but a lot of the world, where we're getting uh, young graduates out of K through 12 or higher education um, who don't understand that there's a grammar check on the computer or a spelling check. or um, And we also need to, I think, to be teaching about the soft skills, showing up to work on time, being prepared to work as part of a team, being willing to invest 
and try to grow that company rather than just trying to say, okay, well, I want to work three days a week at home, a couple of days a week at work. Um, just your comments on about that. I think it's uh, it's a great question, Barney. And the truth is that we have to lean into this massively. When I was at FIU, a lot of the work that we did, we built a paid internship, single portal for all students coming out of any college in Miami, not just about FIU. And we worked a lot with those uh, those things that would be really EQ, look somebody in the eye, have a human connection with them, right? These things really, really matter. Um, uh, it is concerning for us because I think sometimes, and I say this as somebody who is within the ivory tower, sometimes I think that this doesn't translate from governance spaces or faculty sentence into how it is that we're informing and educating and empowering young minds. And at the same time, business, now that I'm back in the private sector, we have to take responsibility as well. It's not good enough to just say, oh, the largest business in town is going to educate and run these programs. Small businesses also have to play their part in uh, helping to re, re, uh, retrain and retool a lot of this talent. But I'll tell you, right, um, we have to take it upon ourselves collectively, right? We can't go backwards. We have to go forward. Like we need to be pushing young minds even further than we are now, right? Like I'll say this, the AI revolution, America, we suffer from what I call a calculus gap. Unless you did calculus in high school, you're not going to compete with a 17-year-old kid coming out of South Korea or India. So saying that they're not going to have algebra is really going to hamper our ability to win in the second half of the 21st century. Because the places that win are places that create makers, that create thinkers, thinkers that matter, these other areas, reason, philosophy, these things not in and of themselves, but as part of the human experience really, really matter. And so I think we have to continue to be a place where we're, we're encouraging, we're instilling that. If we lose that, I think that a lot of the momentum that leaders like yourself Barney have worked on and many of you in this room have been driving, I think we'll start to see a slide backwards. And capital votes very quickly. The trillion dollars today could go to Puerto Rico tomorrow. I mean, this is not a foregone conclusion. You know, and there are nice condos everywhere on planet Earth. People can be deciding where they want to go anywhere at any time at the stroke of a key. We have to be constantly thinking about how do we build our strategic moat? And our strategic moat is human capital. It is, it is people. So thank you. You've been listening to Scythe Issue of the Miami business development firm Lab 22C, speaking before the Economic Club of Florida on May 16th, 2024 in Tallahassee, Florida. For more information on Lab 22C, visit lab22c.com. The Economic Club of Florida promotes interest and enlightenment on important economic, political, and social issues of the day. To learn more, including how to become a member, visit our website at economic-club.com. This program was recorded at the Florida State University Alumni Center in Tallahassee, Florida.